All right, mic check. Should be good. Welcome back to CS196, everyone. Today we have a very exciting lecture. Uh, probably some of the more complicated concepts that we will go through uh, in this semester. And uh, make sure you hang in there tightly and follow along with this lecture as a lot of the concepts do build on each other and we'll have to make sure that we get through it. Uh, so let's, without further ado, get started. So today we're going to talk about memory management in Rust and the implications that it has on its performance and why Rust is such a valuable language to have when it comes to systems programming, where speed is very important and why it's a very nice alternative to traditional programming languages that are used in this realm, such as the C programming language or C++. So before we talk about the Rust memory model, we need to make sure that we build up some prerequisite ideas that you might not be familiar with. Um, so we can go ahead and get started with that. Uh, so first things first, computers use memory. Uh, this is seemingly pretty obvious, but when you write in a very high level programming language like Python, it's very easy to forget what's actually going on under the hood. But uh, Rust makes sure that you can't really forget this. Computers use memory, and what does memory really look like? Well, first things first, we can represent memory kind of at a high level as just blocks that you can place information into. And these blocks are labeled with just normal numbers. So we can say that this is, you know, uh, block zero, one, two, three, et cetera, so on and so forth. But um, traditionally in computer science, the way that memory is uh, labeled or addressed, uh, we don't really go to, in this case, a number like 10. Um, we use what is called hexadecimal. And hexadecimal is essentially, you know, the way in computer science that we represent uh, numbers on a base 16 system. So what does that mean? Well, in the first, um, in the first, when there's only one number present, we just say two times one is equal to two. But as we add more numbers to the left of it, we multiply those numbers by multiples of 16. So what does that mean? Well, uh, once we run out, as we approach 10, we have to use a letter such as A. This is how hexadecimal is. And we say that A just represents 10. Uh, people agreed with this back in the day, and it's just the convention that we follow. A means 10, B means 11, so on and so forth. And when we go on to... Uh, represent larger numbers. So, you know, in this case, we have 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, but instead of going to 16, we add another number to the left of it. Zero times one is zero, and we add that to one times 16, because this is hexadecimal, not, rather, not regular decimal, and this will give us the number 16, and we can do that for all of these numbers going forward. Uh, and just one final caveat, we add in this uh, prefix 0x, just basically saying, you know, if you're a human reading this or a computer, hey, this is actually hexadecimal. These aren't normal numbers. Uh, not extremely important, but this is just traditionally how memory is addressed. But it's very important to understand that typically you can represent memory as these kind of blocks that are addressed by hexadecimal digits. So now another prerequisite, prerequisite for this lecture is the understanding of the stack data structure. So the stack data structure, don't overcomplicate it, is actually quite simple. By now you're probably familiar with like sets and dictionaries and arrays. A stack is just another form of data structure. And the name is actually quite self-explanatory. It is a stack, meaning if you have elements kind of stacked up on, on top of each other, you can think about like a pile of books, for example, or a pile of plates. Uh, you can only remove things from the top of it, and you can only add things to the top of it. So if you have like a pile of plates, that is our stack data structure, you can't take something out from the middle because the whole thing will collapse. So the stack data structure is, you know, you put things onto the top of it, you take things off of the top of it. And that's the only way that you can really interact with it in terms of insertion and deletion. A property of stacks is that they are first in, last out. What that means is that the first thing that goes into the stack will have to be the first one that comes out of the stack. Because as you add things into a stack, you keep adding to the top. In order to get the first thing that you added, you have to pop off everything that came after it. So stacks are first in, last out. Don't really overcomplicate it too much. Just think about like a pile of 
you know, books or a, a deck of cards, etc. So let's very quickly just have a uh, our first Kahoot question just to make sure that we're understanding the you know prerequisite concepts that we talked about so far. Uh, just join in with your net ID as usual. Uh, I'm having problems with uh, my like desktop audio showing on stream today. So you probably won't have Kahoot music, unfortunately. All right, I'll give it another like 10 seconds or so, and then we will continue. Let's go ahead and get started. The Kahoot code is going to be at the bottom, so if you are joining late, no worries. And so stacks are first in, first out, true or false. All right, well done. So this is false. Stacks are first in, first out. Uh, sorry, first in, last out. Another data structure known as the queue is first in, first out, but this is not a data structures class, so we're not going to spend too much time talking about that. Um, stacks are first in, last out. The first thing that comes into the stack will be the last thing coming out because of the way that we are able to insert and delete from it only from the top. All right, so let's continue. So now let's talk about the actual memory model that is in Rust. There are uh, some more concepts to understand, but now we can actually start talking about how Rust handles memory. And so two important terms to define is the stack and the heap. When we talk about memory, we will talk about the stack and the heap quite a bit. What is the stack and what is the heap? Well, they are simply parts of memory that are available to your code to use at runtime, but they're structured in different ways and they're holding different types of data. So let's talk about the stack and the heap. First, let's talk about the stack. So we just talked about the stack data structure and the stack in Rust for the memory model behaves just like the stack data structure, except the data that it's holding in this case is going to be data of a known fixed size. So what do I mean by a known or a fixed size? Well, we have certain types in Rust that we talked about in lecture one, such as like a signed integer of 32 bits or a signed integer of 16 bits. These are of a fixed size because we know exactly how much it's going to be right at compile time. We know that you know an integer will be 32 bits or 16 bits. We know exactly how much space it'll take in memory. And these are the types of things that will be held on the stack. Uh, and so in comparison, when we talk about the heap, the heap is just basically a general term that describes boxes. But in this case, we can use it to store data of an unknown size or a size that might change. So what does that mean? Well, we talked about how like numbers, for example, they're a fixed size. They are an example of something that is a fixed size. What is something that could be an unknown size? Well. You know, for example, a growable array or a growable string. At compile time, we don't know, you know, exactly how much it could be later down in the line because if we allocate space for it, it might go grow larger, it might grow smaller, it might take more space and memory, etc. So for data such as this, we have to use the heap for this. So we'll continue talking about this a bit more in detail so that way it makes more sense, but just kind of keep that in mind. So now let's talk about more the stack in Rust. So we want to imagine the stack in Rust as just basically a person sitting at a table that is reading your code line by line and uh, they have papers coming into their desk. So this is an example that was inspired by you know, another explanation that I saw and I, I really liked it. So we will be using this example today. 
So imagine a person just sitting down at a table and they are reading your code line by line with papers coming in. So here is our code. We have a main function. We have another function. And inside of these functions, we have some variables. And notice that three and five are numbers. These are fixed size values. We know exactly how much they're going to take up in memory at compile time. We don't need to worry about this. So we start you know, our programs typically at the main function. So we will read in the main function. And what we'll do is we'll open up a piece of paper. We're going to write down the main right at the top, the name of the function right at the top of the paper. So in this case, that's main. And we're going to read it line by line. So uh, we will reach this line here where we have number. We will write num is equal to 3. And every single time that we read in a new function, we're going to put this paper down and open up a new piece of paper. So here we are going to other function. So we're going to take our paper, put it down, and we're going to open up a new piece of paper. So here, what we're going to do, first things first, write down the name of the method that we're in, other function. And we see a variable here, other number. We know it's equal to 5. We write that down. And so this is really what we're trying to do when we're representing the stack in Rust. Notice how the first thing that came in is currently the last thing that will come out. This is the bottom of the stack here. Imagine it laying flat on the table. Can't really show that very well in Google Slides. But now this, uh, this variable here, other number, that's equal to 5. When we are out of scope in this function, so we've written down this uh, variable here. Once we reach this point in the code, we're out of scope. So we need to take this paper, rip it up, and throw it away. Why? Because this variable is now out of scope. We want to remove it from memory because 5 was stored in memory uh, in that stack frame. We rip it up. We delete all of the memory that's associated with it. And we go back to the main function. At this point, we are here in our code. We're back in the main function. We, you know, The main function goes out of scope. We take this paper. We rip it up. We throw it away. Our program is over. And all memory that was associated with our program is now cleared out. And we're good. So this is the stack in Rust, used on elements of a fixed size. We talked about 5 and 3. These are signed integers of 32 bits. So that is how the behavior is there. So now, what about elements of an unknown size? This is where we want to use the heap in combination with the stack data structure. So let's do a similar thing here. We have a main function here. Let's open up a stack frame where we write down, first things first, the name of the function. And now we see this variable string. So string is holding this uh, string right here. So uh, some of you might be familiar with this. Some of you might not be. That's totally fine. We'll talk about this more in Rust Lecture 3. But all you really need to understand here is that this is a, is a string that can grow and change in size. So at compile time, we don't know what the size of this is, what, either in that given moment or later down the line. The size of this can change. So as a result of that, we cannot only use the stack. We have to also use the heap in combination with the stack to hold this value in memory. And so the syntax here, just very quickly, we are creating a string type from this string literal, hello, and we are storing it in this uh, variable string. That's what's happening here. But we'll go into the differences between string literals and string types more in Rust Lecture 3. But the big idea here is that this is not something of a fixed size. This is an unknown size or a size that might change. So what, are we, what exactly are we storing on the heap here, uh, or on the stack here? Well, we'll write down the variable name as normal. But what goes in on the right side of this equal sign? We can't exactly put this value here because it's a value that might change. So this is where the heap comes into play. And so we can represent the heap similar to how we saw the, mem the blocks of memory in the very first slide in this presentation. And we can represent this as kind of like a locker room, where each locker holds some sort of information. So for hello, what would that look like? Well, each locker would store a different character of the hello string. So one locker would be H-E-L-L-O. And this is stored in the heap memory. So just to clarify, the stack is the person uh, with these pieces of paper. And the heap is this locker room example. So what do we put on this stack frame? Well, we can put 
elements of a fixed size on the stack. So what, you can, what we can put here is this right here. So what is this? Well, I want you to focus on first this pointer. The length and the capacity, I mean, it's fairly clear what's going on here. The length and the capacity is just saying like how much we've allocated here and how long the string is. But also we have this pointer. So the pointer is basically saying this location in memory right here is holding the hello string. The pointer is a value of fixed size because we don't need, you know, the, the value of a pointer is not going to change. Um, or like the, the size of it won't change. We don't need a bigger pointer to point at something that's really large in memory or really small. The size of the pointer will stay the same, but the value that's stored in memory might change. That's why we use the heap here. So we read in the example here, string is equal to hello. String is equal on the stack to this pointer that will lead us to this element on the heap. Once this value goes out of scope, once, once we reach this bottom curly brace right here, we're going to rust behind the scenes. We'll follow this pointer to the heap, clear out all the associated memory, and we'll be done with the program. Uh, if we have any questions about this, let me know in the chat, but I hope that makes sense. Essentially, once this goes out of scope, we rip up the paper, um, and right before that, we follow the element in memory uh, by, by using the pointer, clear it out, and all associated memory with this program is destroyed. So let's do another Kahoot question. So the stack in Rust holds data of what? I hope this is clear by now. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut that off. Let's continue here. So, well done to the 37 of you. It holds data of a fixed size in comparison with the heap, which holds data of an unknown size or a size that might change. So let's put this all together, really. So we have what is called in Rust, we have what is called ownership. And so there are three rules to ownership in Rust. The first rule of ownership is that every value in Rust has a variable that is called its owner. The second rule is that there can only be one owner at a time. And the third rule is that when that owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at this example here. In a traditional programming language, what would happen here? We have x is equal to 5, and then after that we assign the value that was held in 5 to y. That's what happens in traditional programming languages. What would happen in Rust here? Well, it would be exactly the same. Exa uh, it would be exactly the same thing. We would make a copy of the value in x, which is five, and bind it to y. And the reason why this is the case is because these values are of a fixed size. Integers don't need, you know, more than however much you define it at compile time. So in this case, this is signed integers of 32 bits and it'll just copy over five to be stored in Y. But let's look at a different example. Let's look at hello, which we said is a size of, um, is an unknown size or a size that might change. So what happens here? In a traditional programming language, S1 is equal to hello. When we assign it to S2, we would expect S2 to also be equal to hello. Uh, but this isn't the same in Rust, and this isn't the same as the example we talked about with elements of a fixed size. And the reason why that is is because this value hello is stored on the heap rather than the stack. So this is where we get into the concept of ownership. So here we can say that S1 is the owner of hello. 
So when we have this strip of code here, S1 is the owner of hello. And so when we assign S1 to S2, rather than copying it over or whatever else might happen in other languages, what happens in Rust is we just simply move over the pointer from S1 to S2. So what does that look like? Well, we simply say that S2 now points to the same exact element in memory. And also, S1 becomes invalid. So in your code, after this point down here, after we've made this little move, if we ever try to access S1, if we ever try to do anything with it, our code will not compile. It will say that this is now invalid because we've transferred ownership from one variable to another. So what if I actually did want to make a copy here? What if I wanted to have a copy of S1 into S2? Well, we can still do this in Rust. We will use what is called .clone, uh, but this does something different than what we saw here. What we saw before is just a move operation. It is the same element in memory. The only difference is the variable that is pointing to it is different. However, with clone, we are actually creating and allocating more memory for the same exact, um, you know, for the same exact string, and we will have two different instances of this in memory. And so S1 in this example is the owner of this hello string here. S2 is the owner of this hello string here. So why are we doing this? Well, let's go ahead and keep ownership in mind here. If we had, instead of making a copy when we wanted a copy, or instead of transferring ownership from S1 to S2, here's what would happen if we just said, OK, S1 is the owner of that same hello string, and S2 is the owner of that same hello string. According to the rules of ownership, we said that for one, each value in Rust has a variable called its owner, so that's fine. Both of these you know, are the owner of a value. But the issue is with rules two and three. Rule number two says there can only be one owner at a time. So here we have a value that has two owners, S1 and S2. And the third says that when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped. So what happens in this code here when S1 and S2 goes out of scope? Well, let's say you know we reach this point in the code, and you know it's the end of like a curly brace, for example. Then Rust will go and follow S1 to the location in the heap. It'll clear out this hello string. It'll say, OK, S2 is now out of scope. So here's what will happen. Let me actually write this down. I have, uh, I have a little. I have a little uh, Zoom call with myself here. So what will happen is S1 points to hello, this value on the heap. And so when it goes out of scope, S2 points to the same thing here. When S1 goes out of scope, Rust will follow the pointer to the heap. It'll say, OK, this, this value in memory is gone. I've deleted it. And now when it goes to S2, It'll follow that pointer to the heap, and it's going to try and delete something that has already been deleted. Now, in other programming languages, uh, such as C++, for example, or C, it totally allows you to do this. And you can try to deallocate memory that doesn't exist. And this leads to a lot of problems and some very nasty errors. However, in Rust, the, the, the programming language itself does not allow you to do this. It doesn't even allow you to compile your code in the first place to make these mistakes. And so this is a big point in Rust, safety. This kind of concept right here, where we're preventing the programmer from being able to make these sorts of mistakes, relates to the idea of safety. So Rust is considered to be a very safe language due to these language features. So let's have another Kahoot question. So when transferring a value of unknown size, such as type string, Rust will copy the data. Is this true or is this false?
Okay. Well done. This is indeed false. And the reason why that is, is because we said, you know, if we have a variable, um, let's say hello, and I want to say that S2 is equal to S1, by default, Rust will not copy over the data unless you use dot clone. Instead, what it'll say is um, S2 is now the new owner of hello, and you cannot use S1 anymore. S1 is invalid, and if you try to use it, your code will not compile. Uh, it'll yell at you. So let's continue. There are more concepts in ownership. So uh, what happens when we string this concept of ownership in with functions? What happens when we pass things in and out of functions and return, etc.? Well, functions will take ownership of the variables that are passed to it unless stated otherwise. And this is if the value is stored on the heap. So uh, we'll talk about one, what happens when we pass in variables that are stored on the heap, and the other case, what happens to values that are stored on the stack. So unknown size slash size that might change versus fixed size. So let's have this long code snippet here and we'll break it down. So let's start up top at the main function, just like we did in the stack example. So what happens here? Well, uh, let's write it down. So we'll read in the main function. We have our, our stack here. We have our main function. And we said uh, s is going to be equal to hello. So what that means is on the stack, we have this variable hello, which is holding the pointer to the value that is stored on the heap. This is our heap data, and this is hello. So that's what's going on in that first line. So what happens when we call the print string function with when we uh, call it by passing in s? Well, what happens there is inside of the print string function, uh, functions take ownership of values that are stored on the heap unless stated otherwise. So here we'll have this new we'll have this new uh, uh, stack frame with print string. So print string str for short, and we have the parameter here some string. So sum, and omitted for brevity, some string. This is now the new owner of this hello string. And the original one becomes invalid. Because functions take ownership unless stated otherwise of values that are stored on the heap. So now we'll print out some string. And at this point in the code, some string is now out of scope. This entire function is now out of scope. So what will happen is here, we will uh, go ahead and before we pop it off the call stack, we're going to follow this pointer to the heap, clear out the memory associated with it, rip up the piece of paper, and then go back to the main function. So now we are here. And at this point in the code, hello is deleted from memory and s is now invalid. So now let's look at line seven here. x is equal to five. But five is a variable, uh, five is a value of fixed size. So this is five, a signed integer of 32 bits by default is how these numbers are, uh, the, the type of these numbers by default in Rust. So what happens here? Well, we have this variable x that will be equal to five because this is on the stack, right? This is a fixed size variable. And now when we call print num, what happens is same thing. We'll have this new stack frame, print num. But instead of what we saw earlier where we're transferring ownership, since this is a variable of fixed size, Rust will actually copy the data by default. So now, uh, so we're calling print num, sum num, this is equal to Five. Apologies if the font is too too um, you know too thick or whatever, but uh, we have this variable sum num is equal to five. This is actually copying over the data rather than moving. And the reason why this is is because you know moving a super large variable is actually quite uh, inexpensive compared to copying over the data completely. 
imagine, you know, like a really extreme example. Like, let's say we have a variable that is storing uh, user information for like millions of people, right? Let's just say something extreme like this, and we pass that to a function. If by default that was copied, that would take quite a long time to copy and allocate all of that space for that variable just to be used in that function. But in comparison, something that is of a fixed size, copying over 32 bits, for example, because of, you know it, it's a fixed size integer, copying over 32 bits, this is pretty inexpensive. This isn't, this isn't really costing much time or, or, or memory or whatever you want to call it. So for, for elements of a fixed size, we don't transfer ownership. We just simply copy the value to the variable that is, that is taking it. And so at this point in the code, uh, x will still be valid because it is still the owner of 5. And when x and s go out of scope, the stack frame will be popped off. So that function was out of scope. This function is out of scope. All memory is cleared. And we have no memory left uh, that is allocated for our program. So that was functions taking ownership. Functions can also give ownership back. So let's look at this strip of code here. Uh, we have S1 is equal to gives ownership. So uh, what's going on here is we have our, uh, I think by now I hope you guys understand the stack versus the heap. From now I'm just going to show like, uh, you know, how ownership is moved around. So here S1 is going to be uh, equal to gives ownership. In our, in our gives ownership function, we have some string, which is equal to hello. So what's going on here is some string. Oops, some string equal to hello. And by equal, I mean that some string holds the pointer to the value hello that is stored on the heap within this function. So when we return some string, what happens here is that this function, since it is returning, it is giving the ownership of this value, hello, to S1. So what's going to happen here is S1, S1 is going to be the new owner of, oops, of hello. Some string is both invalid and also cleared out from memory because this function, this stack frame is out of scope now. We ripped it up and took it off the call stack. Uh, so let's look at S3, for example, here. So now we have this uh, variable uh, S2 that is pointing to some value on the heap named hello. And when we call takes and gives back, what's going to happen is a string. So a string is going to become the new owner of the hello string that was previously owned by S2. So this is the new owner. S2 is now invalid. So a string is going to be returned. So functions, when they return, they also give ownership. So now S3 will be the new owner. So now S3 will be the new owner of hello. And this is invalid. So that is what that is what ended up here. We have S3 that is now the owner of hello uh, that you know we allocated um, here. And when this function goes out of scope, we're going to follow that pointer to the heap, clear out the memory, rip off the st stack frame for main, and all memory will be destroyed. OK, so ownership in the context of functions, uh, this can get a little bit tedious, if you couldn't tell having to give back ownership every single time that we want to keep it. Notice what happened there. When we called that function, in order to return ownership back to the main function, we had to make sure that we returned that variable. This can get a little messy sometimes. Uh, and you know, also, it can get pretty tedious. So consider this example. So in this scenario, we have uh, this variable s1, the owner of hello that is stored on the heap. We're going to call calculate length with s1. So now s is going to be the new owner of this hello string right here that is stored on the heap, uh, which we've gone over. Uh, s1 will become invalid because s is the new owner of this hello string right here. Uh, we're going to say length is equal to s.length. Uh, length just returns the length of the string. And we're going to return length. We're not going to return s. So now length is equal to 
this uh, the length of the string hello, which is five. And so S1 is invalid because we transferred ownership over to S here. So when it comes to this print line, Rust will actually throw an error. And the reason why that is is because S1 is not the owner of anything. We said it transferred over ownership to S. So that is now invalid. Uh, but S never, this function never returned ownership of that hello string. And so this will error because S1 is invalid. So to fix this, we need a way to return the ownership of S1 back to the main function. Uh, notice how unclean this is. Notice what's going on here. In order to return the ownership back to the main function, simply when we were trying to find the length, uh, we would have to return a tuple so that way we can return both the ownership of that string back to the main function and also the length. And so now when we actually return this back to the main function, uh, S2 becomes the new owner of that hello string and we can actually use S2 in our print statement here. This is a bit unclean. Using a tuple, you know, it's a, it's a little weird. So if we needed to do this every single time, I would never write Rust code. That would be terrible. Trying to make sure that you're returning ownership every single time uh, when you're not even like uh, using that functionality. Thankfully, Rust is a good programming language and they have a, they have a feature for this. And this is called borrowing. So borrowing is essentially what you will see here. This ampersand, uh, you might have seen it on the homework, but uh, this is actually what's going on here. So in Rust, we have this concept called borrowing in contrast with ownership. Uh, so in this function signature, if I want to say I am now accepting uh, rather than like accepting a string, rather than just a string where I will take ownership of it, in this case, as a function, I'm just going to borrow it. Uh, and what that means is I'm not going to take ownership of it. I'm just going to be able to use it. And so these uh, references here, borrowing references, I I'll use these words in uh, interchangeably. This reference S here is not taking ownership of S1, uh, or sorry, of hello when we pass it over to this function. Rather, it's just borrowing it. It's going to use it, and it's going to you know, be done with it. We won't have to worry about returning ownership because it never took ownership in the first place. And this is especially convenient here because we're just simply finding the length of it. Uh, we won't need ownership of the variable just to find the length. So uh, what will happen here is, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and show you. So we have this variable S1 pointing to hello. And when we call that function uh, saying you can borrow this, but you're not going to take ownership of it, instead of S1 becoming the new owner of hello like this, instead what is happening is S is actually just going to point here and we'll be able to use the value hello like so. And once S goes out of scope, we just take that away and nothing changed. S1 is still the owner of hello, and we can still use it in the main function like usual. So now here's the thing. Uh, uh, an important caveat here is that these references, when you're borrowing something, by default, it's read only. And what I mean by read only is you cannot make changes to that variable. And the reason why that is, is because we can think about like a real life example. If someone borrowed your book, your belongings, whatever it is, and they changed it and they gave it back to you, you wouldn't be very happy about that. Uh, so when it comes to these, you know, when you, when you let people borrow and when it comes to these references, by default, they are read only. So this code right here will actually error. Uh, if you say some string that push string, the string literal, this, this will error. Some string is immutable. We cannot change it. Read only. Uh, so sometimes you might want to actually change the state of the variable. Sometimes you might want to actually, in this case, like we want to uh, mutate the state of the variable. Well, if we want to do this, we can give a mutable reference. So what that means is like if I gave someone a book, I just basically say, uh, here, take the book. You can write things in it. Don't worry about it. Uh, once you're done, just give it back to me. So that's what's going on here. We're basically saying uh, accept a read and write, so uh, a mutable 
reference. We are borrowing that, that string value. I'm going to push this, this um, string to the end of it. And once I'm done in this function, we're fine. Hello world will be our, our final string. We've mutated the state. No worries. The only caveat is that we never took ownership over the string. We just borrowed it. So now one final caveat is this very important rule here. At any given time, you can either have one mutable reference, so that is you know, borrowing a value and being able to write things in it. You can only have one of these. If you were to give out books, you can only give one book out where people are allowed to write into it. Or, this or is very important here, you can have any number of immutable references, so that is this ampersand here, immutable reference versus mutable reference. Uh, so this is read only borrow versus read and write only borrow. You can give any number of these immutable references, but you cannot give them at the same time. So you know, if we had R1 and R2, but R3 wasn't here, that would be no problem. But as soon as we have this final variable here, in conjunction with those, we have a big problem because it violates that rule. Uh, similarly, if we had just this R3 by itself without R1 and R2, that would be fine. But as soon as we have all of them together, we have a problem. So you can only have one mutable reference or any number of immutable references, but not at the same time. And the reason why that is, is because you have to be mindful of people accessing the same, um, the same elements in memory. So let's say you know this was, for example, a book in real life. But the difference is, in this book, the actual text inside of the book, if you were to change anything in there, uh, the words will change on the page for anyone else that's reading that book. So if I gave out two, for example, you know, even let's say one book where people could write things into it, if I also gave out a bunch of books that people could only read from, they'd be reading it, expecting it to stay the same exact way when they first received it, and while they're reading it, the words are changing on the page. This is unexpected behavior, and this also ties back to the point of safety that we talked about with Rust. This is another point that other languages like C and C++ struggle with. Um, so this kind of unexpected behavior, Rust does not let you have by enforcing this rule here. Your code will not compile. So let's have a, a couple more Kahoot questions. We're approaching the end of this lecture. So here we have this function header. Hope it's not too small. Um, we have A, B, and C. Uh, this is related to understanding how variables take ownership when it comes to borrowing references, immutable references, etc. Okay, well done. So let's go ahead and go through this here. So, oops, I'm clicking in the wrong place, okay. So A is just accepting a string, and we said by default, functions will take ownership of a value unless stated otherwise. We have it stated otherwise here, so A will transfer, you know, whatever value that it's accepting, A will take ownership over that value. If it is a value that is stored on the heap. If it is a value that's stored on the stack, it will copy the data over into this variable A. B is accepting a um, read-only borrow. It is borrowing this value, and, and it can only read from it. It can't write values into it. And C is a read and write, so this is mutable borrow because of the ampersand and the mute. Let's continue here. I'm going to have to probably cut these questions a bit shorter on the time, so like 30 seconds. And if anyone has like issues with uh, latency, my apologies. 
So if we have any immutable, uh, if we can we have as many immutable re immutable references as we want, true or false? English is hard. I'm very sorry. And I'm going to cut this off in five, four, three, two, one. Well done to the 33 of you. This is true. We can have any number of immutable references as we want. If I give out a bunch of books, they can read them, no problem. Now let's talk about this next question here. Uh, we can have as many mutable references as we want, true or false. Same thing here, just 30 seconds. Uh, running a little low on time here. Okay, so this is false. We can only have one mutable reference. And the reason why that is, is keep in mind that example of the book. If we give out a bunch of permission to write things into book, but the caveat is that the words actually will change on the page for other people that are accessing the, the, the book, uh, that's a bunch of unexpected behavior. People will be confused out of their mind. So we can only give one. Final question of the Kahoot. We have just a little bit more content right after this. Uh, we, are, we are approaching the end here. So we can have both one mutable reference and any number of immutable references at the same time, true or false. I'm going to have to cut this off in like five seconds. All right, so this is false and the reason why that is is this little caveat that we talked about here. You can have either one mutable reference or any number of immutable references, but not at the same time. This is really important. This part right here, not at the same time. Uh, this is at the same time, so that's false. We can only have any number of immutable or only one mutable reference. Keep that book, book example in mind. So uh, last little bit of information here. Uh, how are reference variables stored in memory? We need to talk, if we're talking about references and borrowing, we need to talk very quickly about dereferencing. And so the, the way that we talk, said that they're stored in memory is that the variable that is the reference to uh, you know, the other variable, it'll just simply point to it like this. So like S, if we have a reference to S1, it'll just point to S1 not the actual value. And so the reason why this is important is because we need to talk about dereferencing. Since the variable holding the reference is not the value itself, rather it's just pointing to the value, uh, pointing to the variable that points to the value, uh, we need to do what is called dereferencing to access the value. So here, if I'm passing in, let's say a number to this uh, num to increment here, um, uh, sorry, to this number here. Number will borrow it. It'll be a, 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 a mutable borrow. It'll increment the number, um, this variable by five. But notice this little star here. This basically means that we are dereferencing this variable because we want to just follow the pointer to the actual value itself. Because if we didn't have this pointer, uh, this um, star here that says dereferencing, then we would try to increment a pointer. Rust won't allow us to do that. And you might ask, why didn't we need to dereference in previous examples? Well, uh, in some cases, Rust actually does this for you. So here, when we passed in that reference, uh, we didn't need to dereference s here because dot length, uh, when we call dot length, it'll dereference s and then apply dot length to it. Uh, same thing with uh, push string, et cetera. So you'll have to read the docs on what does automatic dereferencing. But just know that in some cases you will have to dereference the reference that you accept because it is not the actual value. This reference is just simply pointing to the variable holding the value. Why do we need to do all of this? So we just talked about this, this lecture with a bunch of concepts with memory management. This sounds crazy. Why, why do we need to do this? Why not just write Python? What does Java do in comparison? Well, Java has what is called a garbage collector. These are gonna be the last few slides here, but 
Java has what is called a garbage collector. And, and essentially what the garbage collector does to handle this memory management is it'll just basically look around for memory, uh, the memory that we're no longer using, and it'll delete it. It'll deallocate it. It'll free it away from memory. All the work is done for you. This is why you haven't had to handle memory management in Java. Other languages like C and C++, you need to handle the memory ma management essentially entirely uh, by yourself. Uh, Rust does kind of like a happy medium between the two. So why doesn't every language just use garbage collection? Uh, I want to show this like somewhat inaccurate but mostly accurate graph. Uh, this is mainly just to kind of prove the point. It's not like completely accurate, of course. Uh, but the, the y-axis here is control and performance, and the x-axis here is safety. And so the, the idea that we want to talk about here is that programming languages do have trade-offs. Um, so safety was the idea that I kind of sprinkled in throughout the lecture, the, the idea of not being able to delete things in memory that were already deleted, et cetera. Languages like C and C++, they give you that control completely. Rust kind of handles it for you. But C++, C++ they give you that control completely. And so sometimes, you know, the programmer, a lot of the times, especially you'll notice when you take CS225 and the latter end of CS126, CS241, et cetera, when you're introduced to C and C++, uh, the programmer often messes up and will have a lot of bugs, especially, and at the end of the semester, we'll talk about concurrency. You know, when programs get really large and complicated, it's kind of difficult to, you know, manage memory completely by yourself. So Rust uh, ensures this safety. And, you know, a lot of other languages ensure that kind of, like, similar safety, too. Java, you know, you never really have issues like um, deallocating the same element in memory, like, two times, etc. Um, but the, the trade-offs are in, in performance and safety. We see Rust all the way up top that is succeeding at a very similar level to C and C++ in terms of performance, but also completely beating it in terms of safety. This is why Rust is such an attractive programming language to use. And this is why Rust is gaining a lot of steam when it comes to the field of systems programming languages. And programming language does matter. So, you know, why can't I just use Python for everything? I hate this. I don't like this. This is stupid. Um, well, keep this in mind. Certain languages are better for certain things. So, like, for example, I would say for, like, very quick and easy data processing, for example. Like, Python is awesome for that. For spinning up things really fast, you know, writing cool projects, Python is awesome for that. Programming languages have their use cases. The use case for Rust isn't really the same use case for Python. If you're just trying to like spin up a project really fast and do something cool, you probably don't want to use Rust, in my opinion, because it is, uh, you know, it, there's a decent overhead and upfront cost. But, uh, you know, if you're working in, in like a distributed system in industry where you need a really high performance, fast program that is able to process a bunch of requests at the same time, uh, Rust does that very well, and it does it at a very similar level to what you see with uh, C and C++. So, and the reason why it's able to accomplish speed and safety and control and performance, et cetera, is because a lot of the concept that we talked about in today's lecture with ownership, borrowing, and how Rust interacts with memory in the Rust memory model. So that is it for today's lecture. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Uh, we have uh, Rust homework two released tonight. That was what I had here. It should be released basically in like seven minutes. And we have midterm presentations on Thursday. So uh, have fun. Not a good drawer.